Hi, I'm Laura. Hey, I'm Stefan, and you're listening to Attributed, a podcast library by Dream Data. The purpose of it is to store and share all the knowledge that we have gathered across Dream Data employees through our LinkedIn Lives, podcasts, and webinars. The typical topics you'll find here can be stuff like marketing, sales, B2B ads, operations, social selling, maybe. Good to see you, and uh, I want to say thank you for the the beers that we <laughs> we got on uh, Paddle's account in uh, in Barcelona. That was a super nice uh, boat trip that you guys had arranged. Yeah, thanks. Where, yeah, where, thanks where are you at in the world uh, to, today, Patrick? Uh, I'm in Puerto Rico, so I'm down oh, here. Rico. This is where this is where I live now, down in the Caribbean. So yeah, it's a good good time. <laughs> Not too bad. Not too bad. So what time is it? Uh, it's about 10 a.m., 10 oh. Eastern. So not too, not too oh. late. No, the, not the, oh. uh, I've been following your first thoughts, uh, coffee on Twitter as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the one thing I'm actually going to bring it back. I haven't, uh, <laughs> haven't had it in a while, but I'm bringing Some it back. Stuff. So, yeah. But uh, yeah, Patrick, I'm so eager to, to pick your brain. And uh, obviously there's some... Uh, Wait to what you say, given the, the results that you've kind of achieved throughout the like your li lifespan with uh, ProfitWell. But the idea is basically for us today just to look at. I just checked LinkedIn. It seemed like it took approximately ten years from uh, from the founding of ProfitWell until this. Yeah, let's call it crazy or very impressive uh, sale to to paddle. So I wanted to mm -hmm. just you know go back there and see uh, what is the kind of few things that come in come to mind for you that were really kind of inflictions points for the growth that you saw maybe if we go mm. all the way back what was the some of the first things that uh, that got your business off the ground yeah it's a good question i think um so yeah patrick campbell on the c or i was the ceo founder of a company called profit well um we bootstrapped for about 10 years uh, and then sold to a company called Paddle, um, which does, uh, and basically our combined mission is we help subscription companies run and grow automatically. Um, so Paddle takes care of all of your taxes, your billing, your currency, stuff like that. And then ProfitWell takes care of churn, um, pricing, um, free metrics, all that kind of fun stuff. And so, um, yeah, in the beginning, it wasn't, uh, obviously it wasn't that glamorous, you know, it's <laughs> 10 year overnight success, as they say. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's just me in a room basically working 18 hours a day um, solo. And so that was not fun. Uh, and so, I mean, it was fun a lot. I think we we uh, we kind of romanticized those early days uh, for, for better and for worse. But in the early days, um, I think content was a big thing for us. One of our advisors um, was the, the head of product at HubSpot. So we ended up getting a, a free HubSpot account. And um, I did not I thought marketing was just like ads like I knew nothing about marketing absolutely nothing um I thought marketing was was Google ads because I had worked at Google previously and so I learned about this thing called inbound marketing um blogging I I wasn't even that like voracious of a reader of blogs like it was just like I didn't know what was going on so I was just like well we have a free account um might as well like start publishing content right and we had an ebook yeah and then we publish a blog that would lead to the ebook. People would download the ebook. I would email the people, you know, everyone on the ebook. Um, I didn't really get it at first. Like, I would try to basically sell everybody, um, you know, on on you know pricing and things like that because it was just a pricing product at the time. But yeah, that was that was kind of how it worked in the early days. And I would post uh, each each blog post. I would post it to. Uh, I'd send it to the email list that I had, you know, that I was building, even though it was really small. And then I would yeah. I would post it to LinkedIn groups back when that was kind of a hack was to, you know, post to LinkedIn and stuff like that. So yeah, that was that was the earliest of days, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think it's still uh, I guess it's a, it's a decent place to start for most people if they start off from scratch. Yeah. If you have no reach, then you gotta start describing what is the, what what's what are you doing, and also make sure that you actually redistribute it to the, the few followers that you you do pick up. Yeah, and I think that's the thing that a lot of people like get very um, upset about, or or the beginner's mindset, or the kind of like beginner naivete is really important there. Because, for example, like if I um, 
you know, if I started now, I'd probably get discouraged because yeah. it's not going fast enough, right? And it took, you know, now people look at us and we've done a lot since, you know, video content, podcasts, things like that. But like when you think about it, all of a sudden there's like, you know, in the early days, it was like, oh, 30 people read this thing that I worked mm. eight hours on, right? Yeah. And then over time, it took like six months to kind of get like a bit of a following, a little bit of SEO juice, like that type of a thing. And so I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of excited now because, um, well, the one downside, you know, to the sale is I've kind of lost my audience a bit, like not completely, like obviously people on social note, but I don't, I don't own the list anymore, right? And I would argue like I didn't really own the list either because like the company owned the list and that's kind of how it's set up. But like now I'm like kind of excited because I'm like, oh, like <laughs> I'm going to get kicked in the face again and I'm going to try to build another audience, you know, and I, yeah. I personally own, you know, my own personal audience, that type of a thing. So yeah, it's, it's interesting. Super nice. Yeah, there's so many things. <laughs> I just I can just anecdotally mention that, for example, the Profit Well blog, I've found a ton of inspiration for whenever I've been in a situation where like, how do I improve my pricing page or <laughs> any kind of like, how do we set new pricing tiers? And it, it, that it always showed up. But I, what I really noticed was that the, the extreme quality of the writing that went in there, you could really feel yeah. that it was somebody who actually cared about more than just ranking it, but also actually explaining what, what, what is this content and actually wanting to tell a good story through that as well. Yeah, I think that was really important because in the beginning, it was just me writing. So it was just me and um, I, my, I went to school, uh, my background's in econometrics and math, but the one kind of thing that you know, some people know, but not a lot, is um, I went on a debate scholarship so in the States, uh, like speech and debate, like it's an activity, um, you know, it's, it's not like f American football by any means, but it's like super competitive. And I went to, to the top school in the country for that on, you know, on scholarship. <laughs> and so for 40 hours a week for four years, like a full-time job, I was basically writing um, and speaking um, like constantly. And I did this in high school as well. So, you know, over eight years basically. <laughs> And what that, that gave me was the ability to like, like, I didn't know what a blog post was, but I was able to kind of like, okay, so you, I need to write an article about this thing. I need to write basically a speech, right? And you can kind of see that yeah. in stuff. Like I actually am the one writing. Um, there's, there's a conversational tone to it. There's like very, like very structure to it because I, I write in like a very specific structure. And then over time, it was kind of like you just kind of see the like quality bar that happens with certain things. Like mm -hmm. um, you see, like uh, you know, there's a lot of quality in terms of like you know what we care about, and and that was kind of a thing that basically guided us, um, you know, in terms of um, you know content and things like that. Yeah, I think it worked back then. But like I saw your presentation you did at Metadata event last week. And I think you had a stat in there that like today there's like 16 times more competition or more competitors than was it 10 yeah. years ago or something like that. Yeah. And that's the thing that a lot of like marketers and I think a lot of like business leaders don't understand. Um, I think that like, not to rant a little bit, but I think it's like really, really important. Like you realize where you're getting your advice from because a lot of us like we get our advice from people who were successful in it from 2000 to like 2010 or 2000 to 2015. Yeah, yeah And the yeah. issue with getting advice from those individuals is they were in a market that was very different. They were looking in a very different market. They were in a market where you could have like a reasonably okay product, like not even an amazing product. Yeah. And your marketing didn't need to be that interesting. It didn't need to be that successful because you were riding the wave of the internet. Right. If you look at a graph from 2000 to about 2015, the number of people who got on the Internet or bought personal computers, it like just exploded. Right. And then all of a sudden we were getting these brand new marketing channels every single quarter. Like we were getting like all of a sudden or like innovations. Right. You had Google Display yeah. Network, then Google Click to Call. And then, you know, you know, Google AdWords in the early days were penny yeah, a click. Right. Facebook and then all of a sudden Facebook on. comes out and LinkedIn yeah. and then they're all innovating. They're all innovating down. The issue is, is like. That was a world where you just had to be good at following, right? Yeah. You just had to be good at following. But now we're in an environment where you have, we haven't had a brand, like besides TikTok, we haven't, or, or state this better, 
we are now getting a new big marketing innovation every five years. So we had Snapchat five mm. years ago. We have TikTok now. And that cycle has changed so dramatically that you're just sitting in a world where like, if you're taking advice from people who didn't think through the channels and didn't think through, but were just really mm. good at following Greenfield channels, you're just, you're creating at best an okay, like, you know, um, same results marketing or same results growth channel, right? Yeah. At best, right? And I think the one thing that we did, and it was just because we were wired for it, like first principles thinking with my economics background, yeah. was just like, okay, like what makes the most sense from the dollars in to get the dollars out, right? Like yeah. what makes the most sense? And that's what, you know, we kind of explored and, and really found leverage in. And I just, you know, I, I feel bad for a lot of marketers right now because you have the toughest <laughs> job in the business but yeah. a lot of you are taking advice from people who frankly like would not be good in this environment like that's why I there think, are vcs now you know which is not a bad thing it's just that's 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 the reality i think that's really good advice patrick because it's i've i've felt it myself because i've been doing b2b marketing the last 10 15 years as well and every two years another new thing would pop up it would be kind of a blue ocean for example facebook advertising five years ago good quality audience, low competitions. You just wanted to push money in there and it worked. Well, and, but now the problem, and that's the other issue, right? Because people are doing that with TikTok and you should do that with TikTok. You absolutely should follow these innovations. But I think the problem is, is that you have, while this is going on, the original point that you made, you have everyone and their mother starting a website, everyone starting apps, all kinds of different products. And even if you're not competing with them, like directly, you're competing with them for mindshare, right? There's so much noise. Mm -hmm. And the algorithms help with that. But the algorithms, YouTube algorithm, Facebook algorithm, all, all, these, all these social algorithms, but I would even argue the content algorithms, even SEO, they are helping quality. They are promoting quality. And so yeah. when I look at things like you know, people who just are trying to rank, right? Like remember the old 500 word blog posts are just like scattered yeah. <laughs> everywhere, right? That's, that's not a winning, it's not a winning kind of, you know, um, you know, strategy. Now there's some places you do, you do need to have like throwaway content, I would argue, or like, Hey, this, this ad creative isn't going to work that long or the sales yeah. strategy, you know, it's going to become less gimmicky over time or more gimmicky over time. Sorry. You're in a tough environment now. And if you're, you know, just trying to copy everybody, like, I, you know, I hope you get lucky uh, because that's the only <laughs> thing that's going to save you. Just before we return to profit world, and I'm just super curious to hear kind of your, your, your kind of leading up to a tip, tipping point of where should we then be going for growth, uh, like looking out through the next couple of years then? It depends, right? Like it depends on what you're doing. And I think it depends on like your TAM dynamics and your sales cycle. So what yeah. I mean by that is, is if you're selling a consumer product and that consumer product um, has a very short sales cycle, right? You're going to be, you have to be really good at ads. You have to be really good at ads. You have to go chase different places. And if you have the luxury, building up your own brand will yeah. help you more cheaply acquire those users and try to get repeat purchasers. But it's really, really hard, right? Um, it's really, really difficult, right? Um, yeah. In the world of like SaaS and the world of like, um, you know, B2B, I think it's like, it's, it's less about like, you know, anything innovative, right? It's going to be inside sales for a lot of folks and it's going to be, yeah. you know, things like content and building up true media, not just like inbound marketing, right? Because inbound marketing is, is basically just like, you know, a way of getting, you know, signal for, for people from the top of the funnel to the bottom of the funnel, right? Mm. But I think it's just like, doing these things really, really well, and then chasing where you get the most leverage. Some folks, yeah. your company's going to be really, really good at outbound. It might not be in one of your competitors in the direct market. They might be bad at outbound. It's still successful, right? Like it depends on your DNA a little bit. But yeah. I think the point I'm trying to make is like, yeah, there's, there's trends and I can talk to trends that are going on, but like the age of those trends is really, really difficult to like pinpoint because this stuff falls apart all the time. I yeah. think that there's some things that are undefeated, though. I think that, like, you know, really great audience building, like getting mm. truly great at it, which I would argue even profitable wasn't great at it. I think we were better yeah. than most, but we weren't great. I think that's going to be undefeated long term. It's just going to get harder, though, you know, which yeah. is which is why getting started early, I think, is so important. And that's because 
the reason why you're saying that is that the competition is more intense <laughs> than ever. So actually being able to have that strong relation to your buyer persona and really understanding like what is it that they care about and adding value to, to that space? I think it's because relationships that you own, like, you know, and that sounds dramatic, but like a, a relationship that you have a direct connection to yeah. is is something that as long as you nurture that relationship, you can keep going back to it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because I think that like, think of someone clicking on an ad. They click on an ad, they go look at whatever they're clicking on an ad about, and then they kind of make a decision whether they want to keep moving. And yeah. then they're kind of gone forever, right? Until you send them another ad. And like over time, there might be enough brand will that they're like, yeah. oh, I keep seeing ads from this company. Maybe we should talk to them. But even yeah. then, it's very, very short term. But with media or audience building, I don't know, like I can, we're known for SaaS. We're known, like people knew me as the, like this is what's really funny, right? Like we yeah. mentioned the churn talk that I gave, right? People knew me as just the pricing guy, right? And they st there's some yeah. people who only know me as the pricing guy. They have no idea, right? And then there's yeah, people who know me as the churn guy. Uh, meeting with yeah, you but well. now, but look, look what's kind of interesting. So I've, all of a sudden we started going into retention. So all I started talking about was retention. I would still do pricing yeah. talks, but someone would come to me and be like, hey, do you want to do a pricing talk? And I would be like, yeah, I can, but how about a retention talk, right? And they're like, yeah, yeah free content, whatever, right? So all of a sudden now, then I was known as like a churn or retention guy, right? And then, you know, it just became like a SaaS guy, right? Because we published yeah. so much like SaaS content over time, right? Yeah, and yeah. so it's just one of those things where to answer your question, it's like, if I want to serve SaaS companies, right? If I want to sell to SaaS companies, yeah. I will have a career forever, right? Just till I die, right? You yeah. know, if I want to do something different, then I have to like go rebuild another audience in somewhere else, right? Like yeah. the thing I'm thinking about personally is like, you know, what is my you know, personal brand look like beyond just SaaS, right? Like that's something mm. that I'm thinking about, right? And I, I think it's, you know, not to make it about me, but like, I think that's the I'm biggest thinking. thing about, you know, business is if I own the lead, if I nurture that lead and I, I am providing value, there's enough of those people that I can call on to like buy something eventually, right? And, and yeah. I think that's, that's the way to kind of think about some of these things. Super nice. Just before we return to the profit well infliction points, then there's a guy here that has a question for us. So it's, it's a pretty, you could say it's uh, simple, but it's maybe also worth like, considering heavily. Um, how do you recommend to get a mentor? Or I guess like you could also ask, who should you be trying to get as a mentor for yourself? Yeah, it's a good question. I... Do you have any? Yeah. I'm a little more like, yeah, I think it's a really great question. I, I found, I don't know, like whenever you try to formalize this, I think it can, it can like, it didn't, it didn't really work well for me. So here's what, it, here's what I mean by that. So like I had, I had a ton of people who helped me and I had a mm. ton of people I learned from. And then there's some of those people I learned from consistent, meaning like kind of like a mentor relationship where like I would, um, you know, basically, uh, you know, talk like uh, the Wistia guys, the Help Scout founders, the Wildbit founders, and the Litmus founders. That group mm -hmm. in Boston, along yeah. with me, we would like meet up at least a couple times a year, like on our little like foundry retreat, and we would learn from each other and we would hang out and we would do a bunch of different things. Right. And so, that was like the big thing that like helped me is like I had a little peer group, right? And yeah. enough of them were far and fur further than me on a lot of things, right? So that we could like learn from each other, right? So that worked yeah. really, really well. And then I had a bunch of different people that like I would foster relationships with. I'd meet them at conferences or I'd meet them at, um, you know, just, just different meetups or whatever. And then over time, I would like, you know, I'd try to provide them value, try to provide them value. And then like, I would ask them like questions as mm -hmm. well, like as simple as like, what are you using for your, you know, payroll to, Hey, I, I don't, how do you, I, I saw you guys are really good at this. Like, how do you think about it? Right. Like that type of thing. Yeah. And, and I think that that there's two things there. One volume, like having a good group of people that you can kind of lean on. And then two, yeah. like making it, a, a very back and forth, like I'm providing value. Like I would always like, oh, here's some new data I found. Like even if they didn't yeah. ask for it, it's like there's something yeah. that I could have provided, even though they were like further and I was asking them a lot of basic questions. Like I could provide them something. So I think that's that's like the big thing. Now yeah, I think that if you want, yeah, to yeah, yeah, totally. Give and take re re relationship. Otherwise, then yeah, but it's not. 
but it wasn't like formal. It wasn't like I asked them and I mm. said like, Hey, will you be my peer mentor? Will you be my mentor? It was more just like, no, I was building relationships and building friendships. And then it's easy to be like, Hey, what do you guys do for this? Or what do you guys do for that? Right. I think yeah. if you need something that is very deep, like you need something where like this person is going to prioritize you or prioritize mm. your business over themselves, yeah. over their own business when they when you have questions, I think you you need to to basically pay them. Like and I think yeah. that like an yeah. advisor, um, either and, and I'm I'm an advisor for many companies in like some of them it's a like I just get some shares and I'm kind of like on call, which means like when I see yeah. their email and they're like, I have a question about this or, hey, they need like 20 minutes, like I'll just talk to them, right? And yeah. I'll help them with what I can or I'll introduce them to someone else. And then there's others that like I, I actually get paid, you know, on a monthly basis to like, you know, spend time with them or look at their pricing or like do these types of things, right? And so I think that's like helped. And then I've we also have advisors that we've given you know, shares to and stuff like that, um, mm -hmm. you know, previously. And, and I think that's really powerful because what I didn't realize personally, because I try to be helpful, like there's a lot of founders who might be listening to this or, you know, have listened to our content mm -hmm. in the past that I'll just get on the phone with them and help them with their pricing, like without any money. And I yeah. don't know them. I don't have a relationship with them. But what I started realizing is like, there's a lot of people that like, it's just about time. Right. And I'm finding that myself where it's like, I just need as soon as someone has like paid me, I'm like obligated. I feel like I need to make sure they get a good experience. Yeah. And I think that's a thing that I didn't appreciate for other people. I was like, well, why wouldn't people just get on the phone and help? Right. And it's like, well, because yeah. people are busy, right. And they have to prioritize. <laughs> and so I think that like build peer groups and then at the end of the day, just, just, just pay people like, and it'll also make you think about the relationship as well and make sure it's the right person for you. Yeah, I think for myself as well, like peer groups has really been something that has helped me, particularly on a, like a tactical level. Find somebody at your level with similar <coughs> challenges and then have beers with them. Go for burgers. Go yeah. to like a summer house and stay there for a few days. Stuff like yeah, yeah, that. Yeah. Um, so if we say like one gear of Profit World was kind of the start writing blog posts, start building a little audience with some emails and shipping those blog posts. What were kind of the next kind of lever in the engine that kind of started lifting uh, stuff for you then? I think that like that was, we kind of, we kind of did that for years. Like yeah. <laughs> write a blog post <laughs> and then, you know, publish it. But this was just when I was like, I was the only marketer at, at the company. Yeah. Um, and then it kind of became like, well, how do we do more of this? Or how do I like get out of it more? So we started hiring some contractors to, to yeah. write. Um, and I think that like the, the, the next two gears, I would say, were um, just starting inside sales. Like inside sales was like powerful for us, like especially when like you're starting to build. I think inside sales with brand building is really, really powerful because it just makes your inside sales more effective. Yeah. Um, so if you just do inside sales, it's, it, for you that basically means people who actually react on who signs up to the ebook or who creates a free account or yes, yeah, and outbound. Like so inbound and outbound, right? So like someone downloads an ebook, you have an inbound rep that basically is like, "Hey, saw you download the ebook. Like, let's hang out, right?" And then outbound is, you know, obviously someone who's more cold or or coldish, right? And and the reason I said these work in tandem with one another really well is that as your brand builds, outbound gets easier. Right. So mm, they kind of feed yeah. each other. Um, yeah. And so I think that like outbound. Exactly that when we started with outbound, because we yeah. were completely new, new. So all messages that you would try, like reply rate would be super low because like, who the fuck are you? <laughs> I don't know who you are. Yeah, but that's okay. But that's okay though. It depends on what it is, right? Like outbound, I think that if you're getting a cold um, outreach to call ratio of like 5% or more, 5% is not great. Right. Like Profit Wells was about 18, 20%, which is insanely high. I think you're normally targeting like 10% or higher. But if you're getting like 5% or more, like there's something there. Like it can improve over time. But yeah, outbound and inbound sales. So like inside sales was, um, was good for us as a lever. And then we started doing media, which media is just audience building versus just, yeah. you know, SEO building. And uh, with inbound media, a lot of it was um, just focusing in on, um, basically like building audiences through shows, video uh, series, podcast, audio series. Yeah. And then I think the, the biggest thing for us was finding that um, 
as we started, we just started putting a video for each blog post. And as that started happening, all of a sudden, like the brand just skyrocketed because there's so many, it's like very intuitive, but like, it's hard to like realize at the time people don't necessarily want to read, <laughs> you know, Ooh. they want to, you know, <laughs> yeah, they yeah. want to like watch or listen. Right. And so that's, that's kind of, kind of how we structured things. In time is of the essence. So they, maybe they want it on the commute instead where they don't have to read, but they could just listen sure. to it or ride their bike or stuff like that. Did you do uh, yeah, like? Yeah, did yeah. you read out the blog post, or did you record a, like a separate narrative to to put into the video? It was basically. I mean, we should have scripted it in the early days, but we didn't. Uh, what we yeah. did is like, we had the blog post. Normally, it was a blog post I wrote. We then I had like an outline, and then I would just kind of like speak to the outline, and then it would be like doing too many takes. Um, so that's why we probably should have scripted it a little bit, added, you know, a teleprompter or something like that. That's where we got to eventually. Mm. But uh, yeah, yeah, that was kind of the the structure. Yeah. How did you mon start monetizing the audience then? Because like, yeah, I think that's like um, from a business point of view, the disconnect sometimes comes if you only build the audience, but you know, don't make some dollars yeah. out, of, out of that audience as well. Yeah, but I think I think that's I think if if your instinct is to go right to there. Like it's not the it's not the first thing you should be thinking about, mm. and I know that sounds ironic coming from a guy with a math background, but the problem is is like you're trying to build brand, and brand has measurable pieces, but it's not measurable overall. And if you're a marketer who only cares about measurement, you're probably going to fail. Like, and when I say fail, yeah. I mean your 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 ceiling is going to be a lot lower than you think. And here's the reason yeah. why, right? So. We have the ability to measure as much as we can the beginning and the end of something typically, right? Mm. That's where they downloaded the ebook. That's where they like came in off of, you know, this website. That's where they like filled out a form, whatever it is. And then did they become money, right? So at a very yeah. high level, we can look at, okay, here's all the people that came in and here's how much money, here's how much money we spent and here's how much money we made, right? So that type of like measurement and then as much measurement as you can in between those two points is great. But if you're relying on perfection there, anyone asks you for perfection, they're, they're probably very inexperienced. And the reason mm. is, is because pure attribution is, 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 is not, it is an aim. It is not like, it's, it's, it's like, you're never going to perfectly get there. You're going to get enough mm. of it. And if we can get 80% of it, 90% of it, that's amazing. Yeah, right? yeah, and that yeah. doesn't mean we don't like try right now. There's some people listening and they're like, I'm going to not use these tools. I'm not going to buy these tools. It's like, no, 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 no. Buy the tools, make sure someone's focused on it. Make sure you have a good ops like function that's trying yeah. to get there. But the reason I mentioned that is because if we were trying to measure money in the beginning, we would never have done it because mm. it's something that takes some time. Building an yeah. audience is not like, oh, great. I published two episodes. I made money, right? Yeah. It has to be like part of a strategy where over time you're like, oh, great. Like we have these, like we have all these C-levels and VPs listening to the show every single week. It's not Mr. Beast going viral. It's like, you know, we have 3,000 people listening to this like content every single week. I can't even get a webinar that gets 1,000 people per week, right? No. So it's like thinking through the logic of it. And then letting the money kind of take care of itself within reason, right? You're still mm. looking at the beginning. You're still looking at the end. So it's a very nuanced point, but I think it's like, like monetization, the beauty of brand is like monetization comes from your software. And as long as you're going after the right audience and as long as you're measuring engagement on that audience and you're, as long mm. as you're getting like the right people, all of a sudden, like the money takes care of itself, which yeah. is a hard thing to realize. It's a really, really hard thing to realize. And I, I do think a lot of marketers know like experienced marketers know that anyone who's like well how much money did that blog post make it's like mm. oh my god what a stupid question like it's yeah. it's a great question but it's like that is not the thing you should fixate on you should fixate on the overall data picture and the overall monetization picture yeah and like if maybe there is clearly some type of blog post that actually do yield more than others so maybe it's yeah. more of a type of content that you need to develop rather than uh, than the other. Yeah, and to be clear, you should have attribution software. You should be trying to get this better every single day, right? And and I don't want that to get lost, right? But yeah. it's kind of like a, 
I think the problem with a lot of like leaders when it comes to marketing is they think about like, well, I need this perfect thing. And if it's not perfect, I'm not going to do it or I'm not going to do anything. Right. And I think that's the issue. But I think what we realized being data like smart is we were like, okay, V1 of our data isn't going to be amazing, but it's going to be something, right? Beginning and end. V2 of the data is, okay, we can start to see and break stuff out. V3 of the data is we can start to break out a lot of stuff. V4 of the data, we can start to break out each blog post, Mm -hmm. right? And we want to track that, right? And we want to take the most successful blog posts and we want to put them, you know, as you're talking about, like we want to put them at the top of the page because there's something about them, right? Marketing is both a science and an art. And you yeah. don't want to be so science that you like shoot yourself in the foot. And you don't want to be so art that you're not measuring anything, right? <laughs> so I've definitely, I've definitely been, been too science in my career earlier. Whereas yeah. like, be more prone now to think about, let's speak to the right people with the right messaging first. And then we make sure yeah. we measure everything we can afterwards. And that's the other thing, right? Measure everything. Make sure you can look at the data later. Like I do believe in measure everything. I don't want that to get like to get yeah. that misconstrued. But the thing is, is like you're not gonna be able to like consume the information at every stage because you just don't have the time. And this is the other mistake a lot of people do. Is like they're like ten years into their business and they're like, we need attribution, right? And it's mm-hmm. like, well, if you're measuring the data from the beginning or as close as possible from the beginning, then I can look back and look at everything right? Mm. Because I have the data and I think that's super, super valuable. But it's, it's kind of like knowing that you're not going to be that sophisticated now, but you're going to get more sophisticated every single quarter. And I think that's, that's the biggest thing with attribution that people miss. Yeah. What, uh, how much time do you have left now, Patrick, just to be respectful of... Uh... Whatever time you want. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I saw you spent nine hours uh, just saying cheers. There you so. go. But I do yeah, have yeah, a yeah. three-year-old out <laughs> in the back I need to take care of at some point. Is there anything, other kind of tangible stuff from the profit world journey that you think we should mention here that people could, could take and implement or at least think about for their business? Yeah, lots of, th- hopefully lots of things, <laughs> right? You know, yeah. I think that like, but I don't know. I think, I think something um, tangible uh, that you guys did. I think I, I personally, I love these things where I can go back and, uh, and test it out. Yeah, I think um, one thing we did that was really successful and it still is successful is um, video-based outbound emails. Like if I sent you an email and I was just like, you know, hey, Patrick here from Profile, like there's an actual video and embedding, you can't yeah. view it in the email, but you can embed a thumbnail in the email. Yeah, and then you go. Um, yeah, and then that goes to a landing page. That was really, really successful. I think adding a video. Sorry? What did you actually have in that specific uh, video then? It was, it was exactly what I just said. It was me okay. or a, a rep in front of a screen being like, hey, I'm Patrick, blah, blah, blah. There was, a, there was like a 60-second video scripted, yeah. all kinds of fun stuff, um, graphics, those types of things. Yeah, so that was a big thing. I think that adding video to each blog post I think is a big thing, like starting to do that. That was really, really powerful. Um, I think that's something that someone can tangibly and easily do. Um, but like most things, make sure you do like a hundred of them. Don't just do one and call it a failure. Um, yeah, like commit yeah, to the yeah, test. Yeah. Um, and then I think a third one that might be helpful. Um, we did really well with events. Um, so and I think the reason we do so well with events is because we treated it like we have to do well with events. Yeah. Um, so what I mean by that is like we would like go out of our way to like make sure that um, we're like it has to be successful. So. We have to have all these activations. We have to make sure that like we're recording content in case it's a complete sales failure. So we have you know, some yeah. content from the experience. You know, we have yeah. to do extra supplemental events, all that kind of stuff. And so, yeah, I think um, really, really understanding events is, is a huge, huge thing. It's interesting with events, it's kind of you've almost forgotten it from your playbook because of all this COVID. <laughs> That is kind of yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. that chapter doesn't even exist, uh, and, and now I know it, it does exist a lot again. Now <laughs> you had a boat in Barcelona, for example. But if, at least yep. to myself, I've totally forgotten that. Hey, you can actually get some customers together, get some prospects together, give them a yep, good yep, presentation, yep. and let's see what happens. Yep, 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 yep. 
maybe the, as the last thing then patrick then let's maybe just go through i would love to understand why retention is the thing that you obsess about at the moment and what are the few things you think is the most powerful in terms of taking that in a in a positive uh, direction at the end of the day lifetime value is the name of the game um and so with lifetime value like it has function of two things how long people stick around, like how many months they're buying from you or how many times they yeah. repeat purchase, whatever you're one time selling and your price. Right. And so I think that we focus so much, um, both from an emotional standpoint, but from a budget standpoint as well. And there's, there's good reasons for that. There's bad reasons for that on the beginning of the relationship with a customer, like, Hey, they became a customer, right? Amazing. Let's give, mm, yeah. um, you know, let's give everyone, you know, their bonuses, let's high five, let's report that, let's get really excited, let's hold a sales party, all those other things. I think the issue is, is that like, you look at the success of your company, and it, it has nothing to do with that first moment, it has absolutely nothing to do with that first moment. It has everything to do with how long they stick around, how much they're paying you over time, etc. Right. So I think that like, just logically, that's, that's why it's so important. Also, you improve those two levers, your monetization and your retention. Mm -hmm. It has a much, much higher order effect in improving the overall um, success of your business than if you improve your sales and marketing. Mm -hmm. um, you need to be good at everything, but that's like a big, big thing. Um, that's super, super important. Yeah, and I guess like the good in retention rate is an expression for them <clears throat> willing to go to war for you because they're happy about what they're paying for your product. Sure. And it's, it's okay if it's like, they don't need to be like, you know, the, 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 the best customer ever, right. They don't need to be referring people and stuff like that. Like, right. That, that's amazing when you have those folks, but like have everyone be that. Um, but yeah, it's just super, super important. Then there's uh, just one small uh, request from, uh, from Laura here. Give us a yeah. little churn, churn, churn rap, please. <laughs> no, I'm not going to. Thanks, Laura, but I'm not going to. <laughs> but, uh, um, um, but yeah, appreciate you having me. If, if I can be helpful, obviously, let me know. Yeah. What do people do if uh, they want to reach out to you or try one of your two uh, services nowadays? Uh, yeah, I'm just Patticus on, on Twitter, P-A-T-T-I-C-U-S. Um, and then uh, I'm on LinkedIn as well. I, uh, I do not check my LinkedIn messages uh, for better or for worse. So uh, <laughs> send, send me a DM on Twitter um, or you can hit me up on PC at Patticus.com if you want to hit me up on, on email as well. Awesome stuff. Patrick, thank you so, so, so much for, for taking this time. I'm, uh, I learned a lot personally. and. Uh, I'll definitely revisit the thoughts here about awesome. probably you'll see Jeremy, I can see you listening. So we're going to do some more videos for those blog, uh, pod, uh, sorry, blog posts. We have, we've, it's something we've considered, but just not, not really ever like, let's just sit down and <laughs> record these videos to these blog yeah, posts. Yeah, they don't have to be, don't have to be complicated. Don't have to be complicated no. at all. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, enjoy the day in Puerto Rico and uh, I really appreciate you taking the time. Absolutely. See you guys. Bye. We hope you like listening to us. Subscribe to our podcast and the ones that we have been guests on. And if you have any feedback for us, uh, just do let us know. And should there be a guest that you think we should be talking to, then like pitch us. We're looking forward to seeing you.